the life of an actor. Is this working all right? Yeah. So uh, our next uh, presenter this evening, as uh, you're aware, is uh, Dr. Lawrence Krauss. Now, Lawrence is, uh, has a complicated title. He's Ambrose Swayze Professor of Physics, Professor of Astronomy, not Swayze, but just Professor of Astronomy, and in addition, Director of the Center for Education and Research at Case Western Reserve University, which is in uh, Ohio, uh, for those who don't know. So he's a man of extraordinary scientific talents, a world-renowned theoretical physicist who works in string theory, quantum gravity, particle physics and cosmology, and in areas where all of those subjects come together. He's published hundreds of research papers, and he's an outstanding communicator. In addition to that, he's a familiar contributor to TV and radio, uh, the author of 11 books of the latest count, uh, and many magazines and newspaper articles. He writes on an extraordinary range of topics, uh, from, for example, dark energy, uh, through to science policy, and the place of religion in the education system. He also describes himself as moderately photogenic. <laughs> it is, of course, his best-selling book, The Physics of Star Trek, that brings us together this evening. And I, it's my pleasure that I asked at the beginning, can it really be done? Lawrence Kratz. Thanks a lot for coming. I hope we'll have some fun. Um, and thank you, Armin, for that delightful discussion. And it's a real pleasure to, you can take all that stuff. Thanks, all. Um, it it's, uh, was a pl pleasure and privilege for me to, to, to be able to encourage Armin to come. Uh, my favorite Ferengi, a small bribe helped. And, uh, and he's here. But I do want to, you know, it's a nice night. I come from Cleveland, and, and there are never light nights like this, even in the summer. So. Um, I'm always amazed when anyone comes indoors. Uh, so I want to actually begin this with a bang. And, and actually, I want to show you two clips in, in quick succession. Um, but there's a pop quiz afterwards. And so we've locked the doors. And, um, and so I want you to watch these carefully. And, um, and you'll be ready to answer the question. So let's see if we, if we have the technology. That was a quick one. The next one's a little longer. Okay, let's just leave that up there. Okay, first question. What was that man thinking? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. You do that. Well, actually, that was a rhetorical question, Armin, but in any case, um, uh, he was thinking, what is wrong with this picture? And the answer is absolutely everything, actually. You could write a whole book about it if you really wanted to, but, but the... Um, the main thing that was wrong with that picture is, in fact, one of the biggest bloopers from Star Trek, and, and the movie Aliens got it right, and, and Star Trek didn't, which is that in space, no one can hear you scream. Now, um, that's, that's, it's really quite simple, because in space, there's no medium for sound to travel, and sound is a wave, a pressure wave, and it needs some... And in space, there's no air or water, so, so sound can't travel, and literally, you can hear no one scream. Now, in both of those clips, you saw explosions but you also heard them, okay? And in fact, it was worse. You actually, uh, those explosions were several hundred miles away, and you heard them at the same time as you saw them. <laughs> and and um, now I know that's not the case, because I, I live in Cleveland, which really actually does have the best baseball team in the country. Um, and uh, when I sit in, and watch uh, baseball there, I'm sitting in far back, and I see a home run be hit, um, uh, I, I see it be hit, but then I hear the crack of the bat a lot later, because sound, of course, travels much more slowly than light. So even if you could have heard those explosions, you wouldn't have heard them and seen them at the same time. Now, now in fact, Gene Roddenberry knew this, knew both these things, but he also 
knew what side his bread was buttered on. And um, he knew that without sound, there'd be no syndication. And um, so we decided to bend the laws of physics. And I'm glad he did. I'm personally glad he did because uh, I enjoy the show. And, I, and, and I, you know, I, even though I began with those bloopers, I don't want you to think I'm here to make fun of Star Trek, heaven forbid. Um, and in fact, it, it's an election year. So in the interest of, of equal time, I want to now show you a clip from Star Trek where they got the, the physics right. And in fact, this, I remember this clip well because um, when I taught at Yale, I had a student of mine who was really a, a go-getter student. He was a, uh, and he now teaches at Berkeley, in fact. And uh, he uh, always wanted, was eager to work on whatever we were working on. Except one day he came in and Star Trek VI had just come out, the movie. And he didn't want to talk about gravitational waves from the early universe, which is what we were working on at the time. He, uh, he wanted to talk about this one scene which he could not stop talking about. And he said, you've got to see the movie. So that, that night I went with him to see the movie. And, um, and since then I've heard physicists talking about this particular scene at, at conferences. So I wanted to show it to you. It's, I, I should preface it. It involves um, these assassins who board Chancellor Gorkon's ship to assassinate the Chancellor. And they do what all good assassins would do. They, 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 um, they disable the artificial gravity, so everyone's floating around. But they have their gravity boots on, so they're okay. They can shoot people with impunity, which they, which they proceed to do, and I want to I show it to you. It, it's actually a little, a little violent, but it's alien violence, so it's okay. <laughs> so, so, let's see what we got here. Okay, enough violence. Now, what you, what you saw there was that when the chance got shot, his blood came spurting out, and it came out in nice spherical droplets, okay? Which is, of course, what liquid does in a zero-gravity environment. And, um, you know, if you're as old as I am and you remember the astronauts when they first drank Tang and, they, and, and, and those big spherical droplets would come out of their mouth. Okay, so that's what got my students so excited, okay? And that's what got physicists around the country talking about this. And now, what do you learn from this? You don't learn much physics, but you learn how easily excitable physicists really are. Because <laughs> the, the point is that they ne we never get to see you know, these things done right. So when they get done right, everyone gets very happy. Now, now e the point is that, that Star Trek doesn't need to get it right. Okay? Because it is, in fact, science fiction. And I, I don't really see anyone dressed here tonight, so I don't have to remind you, as I sometimes do. Now, and, and therefore, they don't have to... <laughs> They, oh, there we go. Okay, well, there we go. Oh, sorry. Okay. It's science fiction. I hate to burst your bubble, but um, it's, uh, therefore, it doesn't ever, you know, it doesn't have to get it right. In fact, Roddenberry said that the Enterprise is really a vehicle for drama. And that's, in my mind, really what's kept the series going is the drama, the, the, the stories, the human themes. And if that's the case, you wonder why, why we're having this evening here and why I'd write a book called The Physics of Star Trek when I like to think of myself as a respectable physicist in real life. Um, and the reason I, I, I decided to do it at the time was that, that I think what really has kept Star Trek going for all these years, and Armin touched on the, this a little bit, is that the show's really about possibilities. It's about the possibilities of human civilization getting beyond its petty myopic rivalries, which unfortunately we have to live with right now in extreme cases. It's about the possibilities of alien psychologies, which I think are really what got the writers really excited. But it's really mostly about the possibilities of the universe. That's the mission of the enterprise, so the five-year mission of the enterprise, is really to go out and find out what's possible. And that's why I'm a physicist. That's why I became a physicist. I want to know what's possible in the universe. And as my wife reminds me on a daily basis, I don't care what's practical. I care what's possible. And so, and that's true for all the physicists I know, regardless of what kind of phys physics they do, and scientists generally. We want to know what can happen out there, what's possible in the universe. And so it seemed to me what better way to uh, try and match my own enjoyment and motivation for doing science than to touch on something that really captured the same idea, possibility. So I decided to write that book. And, I didn't have any idea, actually, when I decided to write it, how deeply Star Trek had affected the psyche of people around the world. 